All right. So today we'll start off by describing momentum twister variables. And these are supposed to be the variables that make your life maximally easy when you're talking about uh, uh, scattering amplitudes for massless particles, especially when there is a natural ordering associated with them. Okay? So as we saw when we're talking about Yang-Mills amplitudes, uh, there is a natural ordering, a color ordering associated with the, uh, with the uh, external particles. Um, and when there is that ordering, uh, it's extremely natural to use uh, momentum twister variables. Um, even when there isn't a natural ordering, you can give variables an ordering, and then it's natural to talk about these uh, momentum twister variables. Um, but one motivation for what these things are, which I'll now describe, um, is uh, we have still not yet accomplished uh, our basic kinematical task, which is to describe the uh, the data, the scattering data, in the simplest possible way. Okay? We have, for example, we have made uh, the fact that the momenta are null manifest by writing them in spinner helicity variables. So we write p equals lambda lambda tilde, and then I can choose an unconstrained lambda and lambda tilde, and that gives me null momenta. That's better than saying I have a form momentum p with p squared equals zero, which is a funny constraint on p. The lambda and lambda tilde are unconstrained variables, and I can use them to build uh, an on-shell massless form momentum. And even the redundancy that I have in defining lambda and lambda tilde is good. It tells me about the helicity weight, right? The, the, the little group weight or the, the uh, helicity weight. But we still have the problem that the momenta have to add up to zero. Okay? And um, we'll later come back and think about momentum conservation from yet another geometrical point of view, sort of echoing back to something that we talked about in a very early class. Um, but for now, as very practical people, we just want some way to make it obvious that momentum is conserved and that we have null momenta. So I want to give you a bunch of variables out of which you can build null momenta that add up to zero. Okay, and so we just want to, we just want to accomplish that, uh, that uh, task. Uh, and so let's start by making momentum conservation manifest. And suppose I have particles 1, 2, up to n, and they have momenta p1 mu, p2 mu, up to pn mu. Um, so you see here, I've given them in some ordering, right? I'd say, um, but I have that p1 mu plus p2 mu plus pn mu equals zero. Of course, so far the ordering hasn't mattered for anything because this is a permutation invariant uh, uh, statement in, in any ordering. But now I'm going to interpret the statement as follows. Draw me the uh, first momentum p1 on a four-dimensional or d-dimensional piece of paper, right? Draw it as a vector. Draw me p2, and to end with it, p3, p4, and so on. And the statement of momentum conservation is simply that you get a closed polygon from this picture. Right? So momentum conservation means that we get a closed polygon. All right, so that introduces the, uh, that motivates the introduction of this space. So we'll call this space some dual x space, but I won't write a d here. So this is some x space. Just remember, this is not our usual coordinate space. And in this space, if I just give you n vertices, then I can clearly define n momenta that add up to 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. I just define, if I have uh, a minus 1 and a, I'm going, to, I'm going to associate with each one of these vertices a vector xa mu, xa minus 1 mu. And I'm going to define pa mu to be xa minus xa minus 1. And so trivially, if I do that, the sum of all the pas at is 0, right? So trivially. OK, so if I draw this polygon, I've made momentum conservation manifest. If I use spinner helicity variables, I make the fact of momenta are null manifest. But I still had not made both of them manifest at the same time. What I want to do is give you a picture of a polygon where the vertices are null separated from each other. That's really what I want to do, OK? Now, so let's now do this exercise. Um, in twister space. So what I want to do is take this whole picture 
of n. Now, this is now the twister space not associated with our ordinary space time, but this funny dual space time where the coordinates of units of momenta. OK? But let's just uh, take the twister correspondence, as we talked about last time, and just draw what this picture looks like in the corresponding twister space. Okay, that twister space is called momentum twister space, just to remind us that it's associated with the momenta. <laughs> All right? So let's remember the correspondence. What is this point x1? What is a point in space time? Is a line in twister space. Okay, so there's this line that's associated with the point x1. This whole line is associated with the point x1. All right. There's also a line associated with the point x2. It's another line. But these two points are not separated from each other. So what does that mean for the corresponding points in momentum twister space? They intersect. Okay, so the next point is this line x2, but it's not random. It intersects the first one at some intersection point. Who is that intersection point? If this is x1 and x2, so this is what I was calling p2, right? That intersection point corresponds to this null ray associated with p2. Right? So there's this point here that I could call z2, okay, but z2 is associated with the null ray p2. z2 is a point in twister space, but it's associated with the null ray p2. All right, and so on it goes, right? So in momentum twister space, I get a picture of a whole bunch of lines, one intersecting the other. OK? But now here's the cool thing. I can completely specify such a picture by giving you the intersection points. So if instead of giving you the lines, I just give you these intersection points, z2, z3, I'm Canadian, so I call them z's. Z4, Z1, and so on, right? If to begin with I just give you these Zs, I'm done. Because first I make the line Zi, Zi plus 1, and I identify that with the point Xi. I identify Zi itself with the momentum Pi. So I'm done. It's very cool, right? I've just given you totally unconstrained variables. <laughs> completely unconstrained variables, z1 through zn, out of which I can build, back in ordinary space time, this picture of a null polygon. OK? So let's uh, summarize again what the rules are, what the correspondence is. I've just drawn it already, but just to be slightly cleaner. In dual space time, I would have a picture of xa minus 1 xa, xa plus 1, xa plus 2, and so on. Or let me do it. Uh, uh, how do I want to do it? Let, let me call this xa. Sorry, xa minus 1, xa minus 2, xa plus 1. That's what I'm calling pa. And in momentum twister space, I have like this. So that's the point Z A, Z A minus one, Z A plus one. And X A is associated with the line Z A, Z A plus one. So points in space-time are lines in twister space. Okay, I should have put it the other way, right? Za, za plus 1. This line is associated with the point xa in space-time. Yes? Sorry? Well, yeah, so I, 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 I uh, uh, sorry, what do you mean? You mean uh, how I specified 1 through n to begin with? I just chose 1 through n. So, so when we talk about the Yang-Mills amplitudes, uh, there was a color ordering. So all the amplitudes we talked about had an ordering. And uh, uh, yeah, but, but, but I'm, uh, it's true that we have points, but I'm telling you the rule for how to build uh, 
uh, lines associated with them. I have a bunch of points, but I'm telling you the things I care about are the lines i i plus one. Okay. So that's where the ordering comes in. I label the points. Well, I mean, no, I, I, the, the, there is a natural ordering to the to the amplitude that we're interested in, and so there is. So that's how they're ordered. Okay. But indeed, if you just give me this picture of the z's, there's no obvious. I mean, it's not like a polygon where they, there's some ordering where they look naturally convex. We're going to come back to this point in a big way, okay? So in a very big way to figure out what the analog of convexity and positivity and so on is going to mean. This is going to be a big theme later. But for the moment, yeah, we just draw it willy-nilly, any, any old way, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, but I'm telling you how to associate from this picture of just a bunch of z, a polygon with an ordering, okay? And the way to do it is you have to give an ordering to the points, and then the line 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, and so on gives you the corresponding points. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, so now it is just a matter, yes, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, th th this is a three-dimensional picture, okay? So, uh, no, so generically they, they, they will not cross. And um, again, uh, interesting, interesting singularities of the amplitudes precisely correspond to these lines crossing. Okay, so for instance, if you have x1 plus x2 plus x3 squared equals zero, that means that this polygon is falling on, on uh, on itself, okay. So, so, so we have factorization and so on. So, but here it's just just generic. Everything is uh, everything is uh, everything is generic. This picture is in three dimensions, okay. So, um, uh, yeah, and all the lines uh, apart from these lines that are forced one crosses. Well, just by construction, I'm making one one cross cross the next. <coughs> yes. 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 No, that th these are these are uh, uh, these are uh, these are two points that are null separated. Okay, and so these 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 two null separated points, precisely the statement that they're null separated is is the uh, is the picture that 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 we've drawn here. Okay, so um, so. Uh, um, Yeah, that, that, that's just that, right. Sorry? Yes. Um, yeah, but that, but that, but we're not, that, that, that's a separate question. There's a question about null separation. That it's certainly true. It's certainly true that uh, it's certainly true that, that any of the null rays is complexified. Things intersect in some z, right? Um, that just but uh, but uh, but they're not they're not null separated. Okay. So in other words, in this picture, the only things that are null separated are the things that are the things that we see in in front of us. So. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I think well, if the question was about geometric intersection, I was interpreting as null separation. So the only things that are null separated are the things that we see in this uh, picture. Uh, we can further take this picture and make some of the z's, which are generic, we can make four of the z's lie in a plane. Then some of the corresponding points are null, null separated, and then, and then interesting things happen there. But yes, uh, uh, you're right, that any pair of x's in this picture um, intersect in a point. Okay? And so, uh, uh, the, sorry, not. Any, the null rays extended will intersect in a point in uh, 2, 2 signature here. Uh, when we draw this literal picture of the polygon, we're really literally imagining not the extended lines, but just that segment, that segment, that, that, that segment. But this whole ray is the thing that corresponds to this point, Z2. Okay, so, um, okay, so now it's just a matter of, uh, uh, so now, uh, very concretely, what this means is that if you give me these z's, and let me write them as lambda a and mu a, okay, so they are a four vector. The reason I'm choosing to put lambda a upstairs here is that. Uh, I know that z is going to go with p. So I, I'm anticipating that I'm, I have to get a null momentum out of all of this, right? So I have to get some lambda lambda tilde out of it, but the lambda of the corresponding p's are going to be the lambdas of the, of the z. 
OK? Now this is just an exercise. Do this for the z's. From here, find the xa alpha alpha dots. So what are these? These are like uh, from my definition for what xa is za za plus 1. This is like lambda a mu a plus 1 minus lambda a plus 1 mu a over lambda a lambda a plus 1. Right? And then I'm claiming it's guaranteed that if I take xa minus xa minus 1 alpha alpha dot, that this is null. Okay, this is guaranteed to be null. And in fact, it's going to be lambda a alpha times some lambda tilde a alpha dot. But now you'll get a formula for lambda tilde. Okay, And well, we just have to simplify the algebra there. But here is the concrete formula for lambda tilde. So lambda tilde a alpha dot is the following nice formula. All these contractions are with lambda plus the cyclic shift of this. OK? So what I'm claiming is that if you give me a bunch of z's, then we, we're, we're now done. Um, uh, I've constructed some, so, so given, the, given the z's, which are lambda and mu, I've constructed a lambda and a lambda tilde. Okay, so a bunch of null momenta. And the beautiful thing is that the, that, that the sum of all the lambda lambda tildes is guaranteed to be 0. OK? And you can check, uh, if you don't believe that it came from the construction, you can check that the sum of all the lambda a lambda tilde a is equal to 0. That's another nice application of our favorite uh, trivial sh Kramer's rule identity or the Scout and identity. I guess I'll leave that as a little exercise. OK, so, <clears throat> so if you give me uh, four numbers for every particle, then out of those z's, I construct, uh, I construct momenta that are null and which add up to 0. OK. But of course, these variables also make some other things manifest. First, ignoring anything about symmetries of a theory, the picture of the null polygon is a conformally invariant picture. You give me, like, you give me this null polygon. If I do conformal transformations on it, it'll go to some other null polygon. If I invert, it'll go in some other null polygon. Right? So just the picture of a null polygon is conformally invariant. But now it's under conformal transformations in this funny space, right? in this dual space. So the momentum twisters, the momentum twisters manifest the action of a dual conformal invariance. On the dual spacetime. And as I said, independent of anything about the theory, just means that this picture of a null polygon goes into another null polygon under uh, conformal transformation. Okay? So, uh, but that action is just uh, um, uh, that action is just z a goes to l z a, where l is in S L four. So this is the dual conformal symmetry. All right. Now we'll see why we care about this dual conformal symmetry in a second. Yes? Ah, excellent. I'm coming to this point right now. OK, so, uh, so let's think about, um, 
yeah, this is a, this is a, a cool thing. So, so naively, we're imposing, uh, uh, I mean, let's just do, do counting, right? So naively, when we have momenta, we have three variables associated with every particle, and we have momentum conservation, right? So, so let's just do some, some counting here. So naively, we have uh, uh, four n variables. But then there is a minus 4 for momentum conservation. And of course, there is the, uh, there is the minus n from the little group weight under each variable. So this takes us down to 3n minus 4 variables. Never mind Lorentz transformations, everything else. So just, uh, just counting on the support of momentum conservation. What do we have with the z's? With the z's, naively, we have 4n variables, right? But and so again, we have the overall rescaling on each one. OK, so we have 4n minus n again. But we seem to have 3n variables left over. So what's going on? Any, any clue what is going on? What do you think is going on? Right. So this picture of the polygon, the momenta that we talk about, only depends on the difference of coordinates. OK? And so, so translations are a symmetry of just that null polygon. Okay? So the, uh, the momenta are unchanged under the action of translations in the dual group, in the, in the dual space time. And so that's exactly the minus 4 for the translations in the, uh, in, in, in the dual space. But that already tells you something interesting, that anything you do with these z variables, whatever theory, you know, Ordinary, any theory you have in order, anything you want to do, it might not have dual conformal symmetry. It should at least have translations in the dual space. <laughs> okay, so translations in the uh, dual space are, so the, the minus 4 here are translations in dual space. Okay, but of course, those translations are part of a much bigger SL4 symmetry. Okay, the, 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 the SL4 symmetry that just acts as conformal transformations on all of, all of the z's. OK, so now let's, let's keep, keep going. So let's say we have supersymmetry. So um, then we want to do the same thing. We want to trivialize uh, a super momentum conservation. Okay? And so now we're just going to do the same thing. We're going to have a big calligraphic z, which is the z we had before in the top four components, z and mu. And then there's going to be some eta at the bottom. Okay, these etas are not the same as the other etas that we talked about before, but I'm not going to keep uh, uh, almost forever later. Uh, we'll always work in the usual basis with eta tildes. And when you see etas, it'll be part of momentum twisters. And so um, these etas, the, so the we, we gave a formula for the lambda tildes, which I just wrote down there. Well, there's similarly formula for the eta tildes in terms of the etas. That's exactly the same. Eta tilde A, uh, it's exactly the same with mu replaced by this eta. A minus 1 A, A to A plus 1, plus cyclic over A minus 1 A, A A plus 1. All right? And now, if you give me free Grassman variable, uh, free calligraphic z, then out of them I build etas, uh, I build them lambda, lambda tilde, and eta tilde that satisfies momentum conservation and super momentum conservation. Okay, so you can check again that the sum, that the sum of eta tilde a lambda a is equal to zero uh, in exactly the same way as the sum of lambda a lambda tilde a is equal to zero. Okay. All right. So, um, and this manifests an action again, just purely at the level of kinematics. There's an SL four slash four dual conformal symmetry, dual superconformal symmetry. And as uh, we say, the uh, so the uh, generators are just things that look like z, d, d, z, eta, d, d, z, 
z d d eta and eta d d eta. Okay, and these have different different names, okay, but that's just what it means. So we have four by four superlinear transformations, and they're just generated by these obvious superlinear transformations. Okay, so things that just look like z d d z. Okay. So, so much for kinematics. Now let's uh, go back to talk about the amplitude and say why we care about this dual conformal symmetry. And let's actually go back to the full superamplitude. So let's go back to back to superamplitude for uh, maximally supersymmetric theories. N equals four super Yang mills. And uh, Let's say that I have the amplitude in the ordering 1 through n. OK, well, the amplitude first has a piece, which is the delta function for momentum conservation. That comes along for the ride so much that sometimes we forget to write it down. Right? Um, it also has a piece, which is the, oh, sorry, but this depends on n and uh, that variable I called k hat, which I'm shortly going to define to be, well, which I'm going to define to be k plus 2. All right. Then there is always the super momentum conservation that I'll just write like this. Now, we're, we're talking about the amplitudes within this ordering. And, um, uh, and at tree level, um, everything just breaks up into uh, single color trace pieces, as we saw. In the planar limit, well, we, we, we can do this uh, decomposition in general, but it's, but, but, it's most, but it's most useful in the planar limit. In the planar limit, the only diagrams you ever draw are, if you're drawing Feynman diagrams, would be planar diagrams with this ordering for the particles on the outside. So, so, uh, so, so the ordering is absolute in the planar limit. Okay, so, um, okay. And so the thing which is left, I'm going to give a new name to. I don't know, let's call it m dual, n and k. So what does this depend on? This, this depends on uh, lambda, lambda tilde, and eta tilde. And remember, this whole thing had weight 4 times k hat in eta tildes. This thing already has weight 2, 2 times 4 in all of the eta tildes. So whatever is left has weight 4 times k hat minus 2, which is 4k in eta tildes. Now let's do a little bit more. If you remember, in the super amplitude, each particle had weight minus 2 under the under the little group. So let me just take out a factor that has that little group weight. At the moment it's just there just for uh, just for uh, just for convenience. In fact there's a very natural thing to take out, which is just the denominator that we saw in the Park Taylor formula. Okay. So this whole thing is just the tree level Park Taylor amplitude. It has the correct weight and everything, and so what, what it multiplies is something that has no weight, but it can have more eta tildes in it, right? Okay. So this, in principle, is some other function of the lambda and the lambda tilde and the eta tilde, right? But let's say I say, oh, cool, now I know a way now I know a way to uh, write lambda and lambda tilde uh, in a way that, uh, on the support of momentum conservation and super momentum conservation, right? I know how to write them so that all those things are made manifest. So let me take, this starts off life as a lambda and a lambda tilde and an eta tilde in there. Let me just shove in the formulas I have for lambda tilde and eta tilde. I'll shove it in here, right? And now I'm going to get some function of the lambdas, the mu's, and the eta's. Right? So, so, so far, so good. Um, but what is the claim? The claim is that that function of the lambda and the mu and the eta is not a random function. It's, in fact, invariant under SL4 slash 4 transformations. 
on those variables. Okay? So that's the m and k of lambda and mu and eta, which is just, of course, this is trivially a function of calligraphic za, is invariant invariant under SL4 slash 4 with a few little caveats <laughs> about infrared divergences and, uh, and so on but the uh, collinear divergences but uh, but uh, but at first blush <laughs> uh, just flat out invariant under this uh, dual conformal symmetry okay Okay, so the amplitudes have an obvious conformal invariance. In four dimensions, the amplitudes are the scattering of gluons, right? So at tree level, they have a conformal symmetry. At loop level, n equals four super Yang mills, the coupling constant doesn't run. It's a conformal theory. So you think that at least uh, barring the issue of infrared divergences, the theory, even quantum mechanically, has a conformal symmetry in four dimensions. In five, six, seven dimensions, it doesn't have a conformal symmetry, right? But at least in, in four dimensions, it has a conformal symmetry. The claim is that the amplitude, after you strip off these factors that essentially tell you, that allow you to, to define this null polygon to begin with. See, without these factors, I can't talk about the null polygon. I can't talk about the dual space. With these factors, I can talk about uh, the null polygon that lives on the dual space okay, and some super uh, extension of it. But after you factor out this... Uh, uh, this uh, trivial factor that uh, forces it to live on the dual space, the amplitude is also invariant under conformal transformations in the dual space. Okay, and the conformal transformation and the dual conformal transformations very manifestly don't commute with each other. <laughs> okay, so they're not remotely, uh, they look extremely different. And in fact, if you commute the conformal and the dual conformal symmetry together, you get an infinite dimensional symmetry that's known as the Yangian of SL4 slash 4. Again, um, I'm going to defer talking about how we see these things. We, we have a choice. We can either, in many examples, go through things and, and go, through very, uh, go through kind of unilluminating exercises with generators and commuting things and so on, or in two or three weeks when, we're, when we have the entire Grassmannian picture at our fingertips, all of these things will be like rolling off a log. Okay, so, uh, so I'm, I'm going to, uh, in fact, I'll, maybe I'll force you to do some of them on a problem set so you appreciate uh, what rolling off a log looks like compared to doing them in this brutal way. But uh, I don't want to uh, bog us down in, uh, in, 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 in the thicket that's not very illuminating. So I'm going to defer showing you how all those things work when we have the Grassmannian. Okay? But, um, uh, but anyway, let's, uh, uh, but just, just to say, the uh, dual conformal invariance and the conformal invariance commute into this infinite Yangian symmetry. And it's called the Yangian of SL4 slash 4. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. This is just words for now. Um, a few more things. Uh, so. Uh, this is just, uh, again, just words for now. So um, uh, we know that the, the thing that we're talking about in the original space-time is called an amplitude. Okay, and it, now, now I'm telling you, take the amplitude, you strip this thing off, and you get another object, which is invariant under conformal transformations in the dual space. So could there be a name for this object in the dual space? A physical name for this object in the, in the dual space? And well, what, what would you do if you're a gauge theory person? Um, if you've never seen these things before, never mind, we're not really going to use it or need it. Uh, but if you are, if someone hands you a closed loop in some space time and says that you have a gauge theory, what would you compute associated with that, with that picture? You'd look at the expectation value of a Wilson loop. Okay, so you'd look at the, you'd look at the, the expectation value of trace of e to the i, path order trace of e to the i, uh, uh, dx dot a associated with this null polygon. Okay, and that would give you some function. So this, this Wilson loop would give you some function of the corners of the polygon, x1 through xn. 
this is not a random polygon. It's a polygon with null edges. Right? But you give me this null polygonal Wilson loop. And the claim is that if you calculate the expectation value of this Wilson loop, that's what this guy is. Okay? Now, um, uh, in order for this to be, in order for it to be interesting, I have to tell you what the super Wilson loop is, <laughs> for it to be a, a very clean statement. Anyway, we can define the super Wilson loop. In fact, the cleanest way to define the, the super Wilson loop is in momentum twister space. Um, but uh, but I'm just telling you words for now. So just at least qualitatively, the correspondence is that the amplitude in the original space is computed by a Wilson loop in the dual space. Okay. Yes. The vertices aren't null, they're not separated. Okay, so that each each point in the dual space, that's that's what we're doing, right? This is P1, P2, P3. You're giving me a polygon whose vertices are null separated from each other. Right. So you give me a, a null polygonal Wilson loop. Every time you say that, it sounds a little it sounds null polygamous is what I keep thinking. But anyway, <laughs> a null polygonal Wilson loop. Uh, uh, you give me a null polygonal Wilson loop, the expectation value of that null polygonal Wilson loop appropriately supersymmetrically identified is this guy. Okay? Now, we can actually, so let me, uh, let, but, uh, and I'm, this is, I'm just telling you facts right now. We'll, we'll understand them a little more later. But um, let's go look at what this m tilde looks like in various examples. Okay? So for example, what is m tilde of n and k equals 0 at tree level? Okay? If I'm working at, at tree level, uh, then, uh, then k hat equals 2 was the Park Taylor formula. And so this guy at tree level is just equal to 1. All right? And these guys are called in general n to the k MHV amplitudes. But, which again, back in. They would have k plus 2 negative helicity gluons. All right, so um, notice, notice something. In our definition of momentum twister space, we've broken manifest parity. Okay? Uh, after all, I chose the eta tildes. The act of choosing eta tildes right back at the beginning was chiral. Right? And so parity is interchanging lambda and lambda tilde. It flips k and n minus k. All right? So parity is an interesting operation that gives you a correspondence between the amplitudes for k and n minus k minus 4. Okay? If you just, if you just uh, tr trade k hat to n minus k hat, and I won't write down what the explicit formula is yet because I, uh, um, parity, if I write down k hat, to n minus k hat, it flips k to n minus k minus 4. Okay? So, so parity is, uh, is, is not manifest in momentum twister space. But we'll, we'll, we'll understand it. All right. So, but let's come back to the MH3 amplitude. It's 1 at tree level. OK, and at loop level, so in general, if I do an expansion, it's 1 plus g squared times something m1 loop plus g to the fourth times m2 loop and so on. OK, so you get something from that. And the first hint about, uh, and again, you have to worry about infrared divergences. So there's some universal infrared divergent part you have got to cancel. But well, we're not, uh, this is just a little impressionistic right now. Um, it's this sucker, which is just a, you know, just a function of the z. There's no super anything. That is literally what you get from the bosonic Wilson loop here. So if you don't know any supersymmetry, you don't know anything, uh, but you're still computing an n equals 4 super Yang Mills. Okay? But, uh, but, um, but uh, I don't have to be clever in how I define the Wilson loop. I literally take this picture. I, I, I just compute the Wilson loop, this Wilson loop, in the supersymmetric theory then the expectation value of this Wilson loop actually gives you this function. Okay, so that's the first, uh, that's the first connection. That, uh, um, and then, then, it, then it took some time, a number of years, 
uh, before people realized how to dress up this, super, this object in a supersymmetric way so that you could really make this connection uh, totally precise. Yes? Um, I was looking at the case of the dual space. Yes. And the gauge field is not the dual space. No, the gauge field and the dual space. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. That there's a whole yeah. second world. So this is what I want to stress. There are two worlds. There's two spaces. The original space time, the momentum space, or the lambda lambda tilde associated with the original space time. There, there's an object called an amplitude. Okay? One thing. Another thing, in the dual space, you draw this thing, and now you look at n equals 4 super Yang mills in this dual space. And you calculate the Wilson loop in this dual space. Okay? And uh, so, so, so this already tells you that we thought this whole time we're talking about amplitudes. <laughs> And we thought that all the things we're talking about with factorization and, you know, uh, we get these things happening because the gluon goes on shell and that's why you get a pole and so on and so forth. So the first hint of something interesting going on is that all of those words are also true of the Wilson loop. Okay? So that already gives you some clue that there should be some way of seeing the amplitudes from another point of view because they're not even always amplitudes. <laughs> that the functions that have exactly those properties can also be interpreted as the expectation value of a Wilson loop. It's slightly less familiar, but, uh, but they have exactly the same qualitative and actually quantitative properties. Okay? So, um, but actually right here, right here we have the, we have the, uh, um, uh, so we have actually two sets of objects that label the same function, right? The same function of external data, you know, modulo of this little stripping off. Essentially the same function of external data can either be interpreted as an amplitude in one space time or the expected value of, of a Wilson loop in a dual space time. Okay, and so, um, and well, well, you still might think this is the best you can do, right? Well, I mean, this is already remarkable that there are two different pictures for what the amplitude is. Um, but especially if you have the sort of attitude towards dualities that I would say, you know, 70% of string theorists have, <laughs> um, is that, well, dualities just tell us that there's uh, many different dual descriptions and there's no one description that covers everything. It's kind of like uh, coordinate charts on a manifold. You can either have description in one neighborhood or description in another neighborhood and never the twain shall meet. Well, they overlap, but, uh, but you can't have a description that sees everything, right? Well, here you'd say, great, you want to see the conformal symmetry? Work in the original space. You want to see the dual conformal symmetry? Think in the, uh, think, uh, look amplitudes in the original space or Wilson loops in the dual space both of those pictures have a local space-time description. Different local space-times, right? One of them literally <laughs> inverted, right? Momentum in one is coordinate on the other, okay? So two different local space-time descriptions for exactly the same object, and that's the best we can do, right? We give one, we give the other. Amazing that they both exist, and, and, and that's it. Okay? The gauge coupling is the same on both sides. Yeah, it's, it's a, this is not a strong weak duality. It's a weak, weak duality. In fact, you can think of the, the entire sort of purpose of this course as moving away from dualities, <laughs> something more interesting than, than dualities. And the existence of weak, weak duality is actually the weak, strong duality is this mind-blowing, amazing thing that you have some a weakly coupled system that turns into a strongly, a strongly coupled system is dual to a weakly coupled one. Um, but only one side is useful. <laughs> Right, weak, weak, and it's more surprising from that point of view, right? Is that uh, why should you have, if you think that uh, everything is about the coupling cause, why should you have two different descriptions? That, uh, and, um, but if you stop at that point, you say, okay, good, I have two different weakly coupled descriptions. What we're looking for is a third thing, which is, doesn't make locality in either the first space or the second space manifest, but just makes other things manifest, right? And that's, uh, but it's not a duality, precisely not a duality, because the thing which is where, the object where everything is coming from does not have standard physics names associated with it. That's the whole point. Okay. But I actually now want to give you uh, just more facts. Again, the, the, these facts will become uh, transparent later, but you can have some fun checking bits and pieces of them. Um, so for instance, let's take BCFW, right? Uh, we wrote down, the, uh, we wrote down uh, in components, just with lambdas and lambda tildes, one of the terms in the six point BCFW formula. So the first interesting BCFW formula. Uh, and if you remember, it had those funny looking poles. It had some ordinary poles and had these funny spurious poles. Um, now, we didn't actually even write down a super BCFW yet. That's one of the problems on your problem set is to do super BCFW at four points. OK, 
Okay, but uh, again, it'll be much much cleaner with the uh, uh, Grassmannian picture. But let me let me just uh, write down a formula for you. Uh, let's say for tree amplitudes, for any n and k equals one. So this is what we would call uh, NMHV, na next to maximally helicity violating. Okay, and now this is this. I'm probably going to keep forgetting to put the dual on it. Okay, but this is going to be a function. So the claim is that this is a function of the momentum twister, the super momentum twister variables. Okay, and this is what you get from one particular way of doing BCFW. Remember, it's a, it's a uh, BCFW is a recursion relation. Uh, so there are many ways of uh, running a recursion. Right, you, you go from six. Uh, we start from the six-point amplitude. Let's say. Um, now I'm actually giving you to even for all n, but anyway, uh, you build the amplitude in terms of uh, product of lower ones, and you can choose who you shift as you go down. So there's many ways of doing it. There's one particularly nice way of doing it, so a particularly simple BCFW. But I just want to just illustrate a point, which turns into the following kind of strikingly simple formula, the sum over i and j from 1 to n, or you can have it i less than j, it doesn't matter, um, of this interesting object. So it's a bracket that depends on five variables. Okay? So I, it's a bracket I'll define in a second that depends on five variables, a, b, c, d, e. But the variables are z1, zi, zi plus 1, zj, z, zj plus 1. Okay, and this is what M ends up being. Okay. Oh, sorry. And, uh, and uh, as I said, of course, th th that means that there's also some formula exactly the same. Um, well, let me just leave it like this for a sec. So where this bracket for any, for any five guys is the following thing, is a delta four, So one, two, three, four, eight of five, and then I cycle it around. So so five, two, three, four, eight of one, and so on. Okay, so I, I cycle them all around, divided by one, two, three, four, two, three, four. So five poles downstairs. And remember, everything in brackets here is always A, B, C, D, is always contracted with the epsilon symbol. OK, so first of all, this is really simple looking. Uh, it's certainly much simpler than even the expression that we wrote down, somewhat simpler than the expression that we wrote down before, which but still not so bad compared to like hundreds and hundreds of pages of Feynman diagrams, of course. Secondly, what I want you to notice, and this is the sort of uh, remarkable thing, and you can, you can verify it. Uh, so it's a whole super expression, okay? Um, it's manifestly dual conformal invariant, right? Because uh, the, uh, just the bosonic part, just the SL4 is manifest because everything occurs in brackets. And so what we saw, so this is the exercise that you can do is that Beforehand, we had expressions that look like lambda tilde 5, p6 plus p1, lambda 2. Okay? We had poles like that that occurred downstairs in BCFW. Well, those things group into some of these four brackets. Right? Other brackets are a little more obvious. For example, if I have, uh, so, uh, well, let, 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 let me say something more systematic about it in, in a moment. But at the moment, all I want to point out is that this object is, first of all, manifestly dual conformal invariant. Okay? So that's remarkable. And you'll notice you take the expression, if you just stupidly, I mean, you can do it slightly more cleverly, but if you just stupidly take the expression, shove in the formulas for, for lambda tilde in terms of uh, uh, Z and mu, then you'll magically see that all the things that occur in the denominator turn into four brackets. Okay? 
So that's, uh, so that's how you see the uh, dual conformal symmetry uh, come about. All right, but, but it's completely obvious from where it came from, from our derivation in momentum space, that all the parent terms, before I stripped off this delta 4q, delta 2 times, uh, this delta 2 times 4q, and so on, all the parent terms are obviously conformally invariant. <laughs> right? Everything in, that we're doing with BCFW was obviously conformally invariant in the original space. So this is really cool. The individual terms in BCFW are invariant under both conformal and dual conformal transformations. So this is a remarkable fact. And we'll understand that, again, we'll understand that a lot better. But it's not true that in order to see the conformal and the dual conformal symmetry, the only choice you have is to use a Lagrangian in one space or use a Lagrangian in the other space. No, if you use BCFW, term by term, <laughs> you see that uh, the object is actually invariant under all the symmetries. In fact, the BCFW terms are invariant under the full Yangian symmetry of the theory. Okay, Okay. so what is the price to pay for this? The price to pay is exactly what I highlighted last time when we talked about BCFW. Right? Each term in BCFW has some poles that are legal local poles and has these fun of these, some of these funny spurious poles. Those spurious poles do not correspond to anything. Uh, they don't correspond to some of the momenta squared. They don't correspond to some on-shell particle going on-shell in the space-time, right? So each BCFW term cannot be associated with some ordinary local process in space-time in any way, in any sense, right? It's not local and it's not unitary, term by term. The amplitude, the full amplitude is local and unitary. At tree level, and you know, we know how to, even how to check at tree level. It factorizes on the poles correctly. Uh, it has poles in the right spot and it factorizes correctly. That's true for the full amplitude. But it's not true for the building blocks. There's some simple building blocks of the amplitude that we associate with the BCFW terms. It's not true of the building blocks term by term. Now that might have puzzled you. Why is it, uh, why is it, why is it that, uh, I mean it's already exciting that you can write the answer in a super simple way, but the building blocks can't be associated with processes in space time. And now we have a deeper understanding for why they couldn't be associated with processes in space-time, because exactly the same building blocks are building up a Wilson loop in the dual space-time. Okay? They couldn't possibly have fealty to one space-time or the other. They don't care about locality in space-time at all. They don't care about either one of these space-times. Okay? But they, in fact, see all the symmetries. Right? So, so it is possible to build, uh, it is possible to give an expression for the amplitude that um, makes completely manifest both the conformal and dual conformal symmetry. What we've learned at tree level from BCFW recursion does exactly that. A little later in the course, we'll talk about the, extent, uh, the extension of all this to all loop order, okay? but, uh, but certainly we've talked about things at uh, tree level. But, the sort of the, but now we sort of understand more, more deeply. The building blocks don't look like local processes, don't correspond to local physics in either the original space-time or the dual space-time. They somehow come from a different world. <laughs> they have a different purpose in life. They make the Yangian symmetry manifest. They have other purposes in life that we're going to uh, uncover more. Okay. Yes. Yes. Oh yeah. Well, you just look at. Uh, so let's 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 actually look at let's look at what what uh, the expression here looks like for. Let's look at the special case of this for n equals 6. Okay. So this is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, plus 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, plus 1, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, great. I was just, just about to do this. right? So that's what my general 1i plus 1jj plus 1 formula looks like. Okay. All right. Uh, notice that, that th this bracket has a total anti-symmetry property. <laughs> and if you set any two of these things uh, equal to each other, you actually get, get, get zero. Okay? So uh, anyway, this is what the, these are the three terms in BCFW. If you remember, there are three terms, <laughs> even when we talked about it before, uh, that uh, there, there, there are three terms that came from something that looked like this, and then this, 
and then the other one, and then the other one, right? Okay. So we had these three channels where we separated, uh, you know, six and one. And so anyway, this is what they're uh, uh, transcribed to in this in this picture. But now let's let's look at what the poles look like. So let me forget about the numerator. Let's just look at what the poles look like. So let's see the poles in one, two, three, four, five. So let's just list them. So these are one, two, three, four, two, three, four, five, three, four, five, one. 4, 5, 1, 2, 5, 1, 2, 3. OK? So let's already here see which one of these poles is good and which one of these poles is, is bad. Well, let's first do a more general exercise, um, just specializing things that we talked about last time. So let's say I have a, a given point xi and some other point xj, OK? And let's ask, when is xi minus xj squared equals 0? So let's say that xi and xj are null separated. But i and j, are, we know, we've trivialized that i and i, I plus 1 are null separated. But let's now take two generic points. So what is xi minus xj squared? Well, we remember, we identified xi xi is identified with the line zi, zi plus 1. So xi minus xj squared being null separated means that this bracket, zi, zi plus 1, zj, zj plus 1, is 0. Okay? That means that in momentum twister space, uh, i and i plus 1 intersect j and j plus 1. Okay? So already there's something kind of cool here, right? When I look at this formula, any of these formulas, well, in that BCFW formula, this i i plus 1, j j plus 1 structure is in there a little bit, but there's this 1 sitting in front of the whole thing, right? So there's a lot that's funny about that formula. There's a 1 that's sitting in front of the whole thing, which uh, the whole amplitude should be cyclically invariant, right? So, uh, but anyway, so, um, uh, but that's fine. We, we did the recursion in some particular way, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, it's going to turn out the whole answer doesn't depend on that, on that choice. But let me, let me say a little bit about it. Uh, so, but let's, let's go to this picture now. And so, in momentum twister space, I have these, my six lines, Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, Z5, Z6. So who are the legal poles in this set? 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4 going to 0 means that x3 minus x1 squared goes to 0. That is a legal pole, right? Uh, in fact, in, in, our, in our back in x space, let me draw this again. So if we draw this point, uh, I don't know, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6. And the way we defined it, uh, this would be p1, p2. OK, so let's see what is x1 minus x3 squared. x1 minus x3 squared is that distance. So x3 minus x1 squared is equal to p2 plus p3 squared. OK, so when x1 minus x3 squared goes to 0, any xi minus xj is the sum of the consecutive momenta between i and j. Right? So any xi minus xj squared goes to 0 is a legal pole. And so any bracket ii plus 1, jj plus 1 is a legal pole. OK, so physical poles look like So physical poles are i i plus one, j j plus one, zero, which again corresponds to x j minus x i squared goes to zero. 
okay, which is, I guess, in this uh, picture, uh, p i plus one plus dot dot plus p j squared goes to zero. Okay, so so now all we have to do is look to see which one of these poles look like i plus one j j plus one. And so, so you see, this is physical, this is physical, but 3, 4, 5, 1 is not, right? Because 5 is not next to 1. So this is spurious. 4, 5, 1, 2, that's physical. 5, 1, 2, 3, again, is spurious. OK? OK, let's look at the uh, next one. 1, 2, 3, 5, 6. So we have 1, 2, 3, 5, 2, 3, 5, 6, 3, 5, 6, 1, 5, 6, 1, 2, and 6, 1, 2, 5. OK, spurious, physical. Physic, uh, spurious, physical, physical, right? And finally, the last term is 1, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 3, 4, 5. 3, 4, 5, 6. 4, 5, 6, 1. 5, 6, 1, 3. 6, 1, 3, 5. Spurious. Physical, physical, uh, spurious. Uh, oh, sorry, what am I doing? Uh, I, I copied something down. Uh, five, six, one, three, six, one, three, four. Sorry, this is six, one, three, four. Spurious, physical. All right, so this is cool. Every term has two spurious singularities and uh, three physical ones. Right? That's actually good. How many physical singularities should the six-point amplitude have in total? If you think about it, it's just all the different possible factorizations that we can have. So the factorizations that I can have is a five-point amplitude on one side and a three-point on the other. There are six of those, right? Because I have to choose which set, uh, which, yeah, anyway, there, 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 there are six of those. And there are three that look like a four-particle amplitude on one side, like one, two, three, and then four, five, six on the other side. There's only three of those because as you cycle everything around, uh, uh, if you cycle three, you, you come back to where, where you started. So there's a total of nine physical singularities. And good, we have nine physical poles. And they're all distinct. But each BCFW term also has these two spurious singularities. And now there's a chance that they cancel, right? Because they occur in pairs. So 3, 4, 5, 1 occurs here, and it occurs here. Okay? Uh, they all occur in pairs. 5, 1, 2, 3 occurs here, and it occurs there, and so on. Okay? So, so the spurious singularities occur in pairs. And so you're beginning to get an idea of what's, what's going on. So each one of these terms, you can even start trying to visualize it. It's like kind of like an, an object. It has some good sides, it has some bad sides. They have to like glue together with something else to uh, cancel them. Okay? And in fact, this is not a this is not a specious uh, this is not a specious um, uh, uh, this is not a specious statement for reasons that we'll see. Because um, each one of these things is literally associated with a triangulation of some shape. Okay? So and so you can really think of them as gluing together into an object where all the spurious singularities correspond to internal facets of the gluing, and all the physical singularities correspond to the external ones. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that later. Um, but term by term, they're Yangon invariants. Term by term, they're not local, but the, uh, but, but the locality shows up in, in, in the whole sum. Well, you can, well, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss uh, a lot about this subject uh, uh, later. One of the interesting things is that uh, over and over again, unitarity and locality come together. So if you ask, for example, so here's an exercise that, that, that you, ah, sorry, before I do that, let me actually say one other thing. Um, 
so now notice one funny thing in this formula was that there was a one sitting in front of all of it, right? So surely I should be able to do the same thing with the one replaced by anybody. Like the one could be replaced by two. So surely uh, I should be able to write this formula also as two i i plus one j j plus one. So it would be two, three, four, uh, five, six, plus two, three, four, six, one, plus two, four, five, six, one. That had better come out. We know certainly from, from the, the underlying physics is giving us something totally cyclically invariant. So, all right. So that means that these interesting brackets satisfy this sixth term identity. Now, this is not an, an obvious identity, but they satisfy this interesting sixth term identity. And let's see if you believe they satisfy this sixth term identity, how could we see that the spurious poles cancel? Well, if you write all of those terms and you look at the poles, you'll see the spurious poles in the second term do not show up here, and vice, vice versa. Okay? So if you knew this identity is true, then you know ahead of time that the sum of these terms is actually local. Right? So this is some other indication. These objects, they, they have some life of their own. They satisfy this interesting six-term identity. All right? And this six-term identity guarantees that a particular combination of them is free of spurious poles. All right, and now let me, let me uh, blow your mind slightly. So what is this six-term identity? All right, well, here's a way of getting the six-term identity. Just purely, purely at the level of, uh, purely at the level of playing with expressions, okay? So I'm going to invent a sort of fake six bracket. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? And pretend for a second that this is some kind of simplex, right? So you know that if you have a simplex, there's a notion of a boundary. So just purely, this is purely, you know, uh, a sort of combinatorial statement. Take the boundary of this. So the boundary would be 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, minus 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, plus 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, minus 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, uh, plus 1, 2, 3, uh, 4, 6, minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. OK? OK, and let's see who we have here. 1, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's the first way of writing the amplitude. Okay. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 2, 4, 5, 6, 1. 2, 3, 4, 6, 1. The second way of writing the amplitude. So the identity, the identity that is uh, satisfied by these uh, BCFW terms kind of looks like a homology statement, like the boundary of something equals 0. Right? OK, and by the way, how could we, how could we, uh, how could we use that fact? I mean, it's just, just an observation, right? But how can I use that observation to show that, uh, uh, well, uh, so, and in fact, this is true much more generally, right? I mean, well, well the, 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 the six term identity is always this, uh, uh, th this six term identity has nothing to do with n equals six. It's true for any six variables that I, that I, that I put in there. So how can I use this to, uh, so I want to, for example, I want to see, is it true? Is it true that the sum of 1 i i plus 1 j j plus 1, is this equal to the sum of 2 i i plus 1 j j plus 1? OK? And there is an identity these guys satisfy, which is this six term identity. Right? But I could use zillions of these six term identities over and over and over again. Right? 
the, the question is, can I use these six term identities to somehow massage the first expression to look like the second expression? OK, that's uh, the only identity these things satisfy, it turns out, is this interesting six term identity. But I just want to give you an idea of how you would check if it's even possible for these two things uh, to be related by identities. So what I want to know is, is it true that this difference is this difference a sum of six term identities somehow? Well, if it's true, that means that it has to be the boundary of something. So how can I check if it's a boundary of something? Well, boundary squared is equal to 0. So I just have to compute the boundary of this thing. Right? So now let's look at the boundary the boundary of the sum of 1 i i plus 1 j, j plus 1. So what is this? Well, this is the boundary of this guy, again, just thought of in the formal sense. We don't know why these things are simplices, we don't, but just in the formal sense. The boundary is the sum from the first term, I just get i, i plus 1, j, j plus 1. Then I get minus 1 i, 1 i plus 1, j, j plus 1, plus 1 i, j, j plus 1, minus 1 i, i plus 1, j plus 1 plus uh, 1 i, i plus 1, j. OK? And now, when I do the sum, okay, that's something. But this cancels against that telescopically in the sum. And this cancels against that telescopically in the sum. So this boundary is just the sum over i and j of i, i plus 1, j, j plus 1. It doesn't depend on 1 anymore. All right, so we even see, just purely al algebraically here, that the content of this formula, <laughs> this is its boundary. Its boundary is not 0. But its boundary is the sum of all the i plus 1, j, j plus 1. And isn't that interesting that the i plus 1, j, j plus 1 are all the physical poles? Again, we don't know exactly what this means yet. <laughs> We're just doing these. Uh, I, I want to emphasize, uh, if, you didn't, if you didn't believe, if you didn't follow anything early on, you can just put a sharp stop and just begin with that six term identity, right? I'm just telling you, I have these objects. They satisfy this identity. I've written down some physical for some formulas that I claim are amplitudes. And I'm just asking you to check whether two things are equal on the support of identities like that. Then it's purely this little homological exercise is just letting us see whether that's true. We're later going to interpret all of it geometrically. <laughs> but at the moment, I'm just giving you a flavor of the kind of thing that we're going to be seeing, right? The objects out of which the amplitude are built have the manifest Yangian symmetry. They do not have physical poles in either the or in any space-time, the original or the dual. They satisfy magical homological identities. <laughs> okay, and those identities allow you to express it in many, many different ways and see the equivalence of lots of different ways of, uh, of writing them. So the fact that this is independent of 1 uh, then, of course, tells me that any two formulas with 1 and 2 <laughs> are equal to each other. And it further tells you that this thing is entirely free of all spurious and the only pole that it has are the physical ones where, uh, that look like i plus 1, j, j plus 1. All right, so that's just, giving you, uh, uh, that's just giving you a flavor of the kind of thing that we're going to be uh, seeing a lot more of. Uh, before ending, I, I just want to uh, tell you quickly a little bit about the history of this dual conformal symmetry. So um, this might seem like a kind of exotic, strange symmetry, this dual conformal symmetry. But in fact, it was noticed back in the 1960s. People didn't really know what to make of it, but it was noticed back in the 1960s. And I just want to quickly give you some context for this. So we will, we will see this in a little more uh, detail later, um, but just a little impressionistically for now. So let's look at a simple one-loop diagram. Okay. Um, so ordinarily, if you're doing a field theory course, you would maybe put some loop momentum L here. And you would say that this is the integral d4L 
And this propagator, everything is massless. You say it's L squared, L plus P1 squared, L plus P1 plus P2 squared, L minus P4 squared, something like that. Okay, you would write down some uh, formula. Uh, let me put the L here. So this is L plus P1, L plus P1 plus P2, and so on. All right, well, already there's a nicer way of drawing these integrals. Already there's a nicer way of drawing these integrals um, where we use exactly these same dual variables that we talked about. See, all these uh, momenta are null. So let me overlay on top of this our picture of the x's, right? So here's, uh, right? So, so the difference between these two x's, so this would be x1, x4, that would be p1, right? x2, x3. And that also makes it nice to think of the loop momentum. Is the loop momentum integration is actually integration over a point. You can call x naught in the middle of the space time, right? And then what we call L, or this L, would be x naught minus x3, what I called L there, for example, OK? Um, but instead of drawing that, which has the sort of asymmetry of who you call L here and so on, you do something slightly more symmetrical. And you do something, you'd write d4x not over x naught minus x1 squared, x naught minus x4 squared. Now, next time, and after we do a, a tiny bit of uh, uh, projective geometryology, and we figure out how to write down forms and projective space and so on and so forth, it'll be much easier to check these things. But you can also already check yourself that this object is actually invariant under, or covariant under inversions in x space. <laughs> so it's not obvious. But this simple one loop integral is actually dual conformal invariant. Okay. It has obviously ordinary conformal invariant, as usual, but it's dual conformal invariant as well. Some appropriate numerator that we'll talk about later. And anyway, it's obvious that people were interested in diagrams like this. And it was actually noticed by Wicken, Kutkowski, and many other people uh, in this period that not only that integral, but these kind of ladder integrals that look like that, they look sort of like planar ladder integrals, had a conformal symmetry in momentum space. Okay. Now, why were people drawing these ladder integrals? They were drawing these ladder integrals because they're interested in bound state problems. And if you know something about uh, quantum field theory, uh, you know that in order to see bound states in quantum field theory, uh, when the basic object is in amplitude, <laughs> To see a bound state, you have to sort of keep exchanging a particle over and over and over and over again. And so you have to resum these ladder diagrams. And the planar ones are not the only ones. There are the planar ones, there's non-planar ones, you get more complicated ones. But these just happen to be the easiest ones to examine first and think about. And Wick and Kutkowski and others noticed that this particular set of planar diagrams happen to enjoy this dual symmetry in conformal space, this dual conformal symmetry. Now, in fact, there's a limit of uh, bound state problems where you can really think of these diagrams as dominating. And so what is this hidden SL4 symmetry then? Have we ever seen this hidden SL4 symmetry anywhere else in physics before? What is SL4? Well, SL4, I'm being a little sloppy, is the same as SO6. So there's supposed to be some big hidden SO6 symmetry. Except if I'm talking about a bound state problem, I have two momenta, right? These two momenta are going to break the SO6. Each one is going to break it down to something, right? So one momenta will break the SO6 down to SO5. The other one is going to break the SO5 down to an SO4. So just the presence of the two scattering particles reduces the symmetry from SO6 down to SO4. So this is just the, the two heavy lines here, OK? Reduces SO6 to SO4. Now, that SO4 symmetry is a little bigger than you might have expected. What would you expect for the symmetry of a bound state problem? Rotational invariance, SO3. Have you ever seen this SO4 symmetry before in four dimensions, only in four dimensions? This is what explains why planets go around in ellipses. Okay. The Kepler problem in 3 plus 1 dimensions is integrable. Only in 3 plus 1 dimensions is it integrable. And it's integrable because with the 1 over r potential, there is a larger symmetry than the obvious ones of just rotations, right? There is a Runge lens vector. There is a Runge lens vector that's also conserved. 
and the Runge lens vector enhances the SO3 rotational invariance to an SO4 symmetry. <laughs> okay? So there is this symmetry going back 400 years to explaining why planets go around in, in ellipses. And that Runge lens symmetry is a small subgroup of the dual conformal symmetry. So this is not such a strange, mysterious, uh, exotic, esoteric thing. Uh, it's connected back to basic questions like why planets go around in ellipses. Now, it's just that for a general theory, if I'm doing QED or something, of course I don't just have planar diagrams. I have more complicated diagrams. And then, and, and of course I have wave function normals. I have all kinds of other things that break the dual conformal symmetry. But you could have asked already back then, could there be a theory which would maintain this dual conformal symmetry? Should it be a theory that's conformal, so that nothing runs, and I only get planar diagrams, and that's basically, not quite, but it puts you on the path of, of uh, n equals 4 super Yang mills. So n equals 4 super Yang mills is the, is the theory that actually has the whole dual conformal symmetry, um, but it's sitting there, and the, and the hint of it was sitting there early on in the fact that subclasses of diagrams in uh, quantum field theory had the dual conformal symmetry. And, uh, and finally, uh, this dual conformal symmetry, as I mentioned before, explains why there's no pole at infinity in BCFW. Okay? Why does it explain it? It's because, uh, what, what, what was the point? We're worried when we're doing BCFW shift that maybe there's some singularity in the amplitude at infinite momentum. And we don't know how to control infinite momentum. We don't know what's going on at, at infinite momentum. But because of dual conformal invariance, Infinite momentum is infinitely far away in the dual space. But infinitely far away in the dual space is inverted to just the origin in the dual space, and there's nothing going on. Okay, so there's nothing special about infinity. There's nothing special about infinite momentum because of dual conformal symmetry. Okay? So dual conformal invariance uh, is the sort of symmetry reason why, um, and is related to the sort of, ma I mean, as I explained, it's sort of magical. It's not obvious that things fall off at infinity. Right? And Feynman diagram by diagram, that's not obvious. Now we see why it's not obvious, because the Feynman diagrams don't make the dual <laughs> symmetry manifest, obviously. Right? But because the theory also has the, the dual symmetry, then, uh, then the Feynman diagrams has to conspire in such a way that there is no pole at infinity. Okay? So dual conformal symmetry is also the explanation for why uh, BCFW works to a begin with. All right, so um, those are all the things, uh, both I told you what momentum twisters are and some invitation for the kind of objects we're going to see and the sorts of questions that we're going to pursue. Um, but uh, starting uh, next time, finally, for a few lectures, uh, I hope you have motivation enough uh, to just start playing around in, uh, in projective space and getting comfortable uh, with asking questions like we saw here. Um, questions about when lines intersect, and we just have to practice with lines intersecting planes, planes intersecting each other, et cetera, et cetera. So we just have to become, uh, that's trivial, but we're just going to get good at that, and then after that we can proceed to talk about Grossmannian.